In the most recent part of this series, I introduced the concept of edge fans. They eliminated the physical cracks between quads of different LEDs, and everything appeared to be fine. However, when I began creating mountains and such, some very much visible seams in the lighting appeared to get the quads. This was a result of my lazy implementation of the vertex normals. But after many weeks of research, coding and debugging, I've finally managed to remove them. My name is Simon Holmquist and this is LOD Planets, Episode 4. Before I explain the solution, let's delve a bit deeper into the problem. There are many ways to calculate lighting. A simple way is to use a technique called flat shading. Flat shading can be thought of as treating each polygon as a completely flat surface, meaning roughly that its shading is not affected by nearby polygons. Then there are more complex techniques for interpolating between multiple polygons, giving us the power to create smoother lighting. Render pipelines that utilize rasterization, i.e. filling in polygons with pixels, often use vertex-based shading grow, or fragment-based shading phong, to do this. Both of these can be used together with a plethora of illumination models to achieve a desired look. For rough objects uh, with little to no gloss, such as our terrain, a model called Lambert would do the trick. If you wish to know the extremely convoluted way that I went about things in the beginning, uh, please uh, stay to the end of the video. In many illumination models such as Lambert, vertex normals play a big role. For those of you that don't know, a normal vector is, in this context is basically a vector that points perpendicular to a surface. These can be used to give important information about how an object should be lit, especially in the case of vertex normals. For example, they can tell the renderer which points are in shadow and which are not. However, the line between shadow and light is not always a sharp edge. Sometimes we want to convey the shape of a smooth surface with a limited amount of vertices. To accomplish this, we can utilize a cool feature of our illumination technique. If two adjacent polygons have vertex normals like these, the lighting will create a very noticeable edge between them. However, if we sort of merge these vertex normals together, we get what looks like a smooth edge. The vertex normals make the shadow into a gradient between the two polygons. But how can one calculate these normals? Well, as Sebastian Leigh explains perfectly in one of his videos, from which I've learned a lot, the normal vector of a vertex can be approximated quite well using other vertices that share the same triangles. We'll call the vertex from which the vertex normal will be originating A, this vertex B, and this vertex C. Now we can just take the cross by product of this side AB and this side AC to get a vector perpendicular to both of them. Well, the cross product actually gives us two perpendicular vectors, but this one is the one that we will use. The calculated vertex normal is then applied to all vertices within the triangle. If vertex A exists in all the triangles too, the perpendicular vectors are summed up and normalized to form a single approximation of the vertex normal with a length of 1. This is the code that I wrote for this specific purpose. Well, copy might be a better term to use since Lake provided most of this code in this video. Again, link in the description. Another thing he covered was his method for calculating the normals at the border between two quads. The fact that two adjacent quads don't actually share any of the same vertices makes them unable to affect each other's vertex normals, leaving a very much visible seam between them. To solve this, he created an invisible border of vertices around these quads that he used to simulate the surrounding terrain. Since this border wasn't including the mesh, it pretty much just pushed the seam outside the quad. The indices of the border vertices started at negative 1 and went down. 
This may be easy to distinguish from the normal vertices ledge in the code, since those had vertices with indices from 0 and up. What it didn't provide, however, was the specific modifications for making this work with my edge fans. The vertices on the border are meant to overlap those of the adjacent quads, but if those adjacent quads have edge fans, the predicted geometry is incorrect. Thus, a seam forms there anyway. One might decide to change the position of the border vertices to account for the edge fans, but doing so would mean changing a lot of the core quad generation in the lookup code, which was something that I would have liked to do. Instead, I opted to change the normals of the edge fans that were calculated. I mean so that their normals weren't affected by the visible triangles, but only the border. Additionally, I added another set of border triangles pointing inward on the edge fans to simulate the same border as the adjacent quad. The distance from each border vertex to the visible edge of the quad is different depending on if that edge has edge fans or not. If it does have edge fans, the border vertices are extruded a bit further to accommodate for the fact that the quad which they should overlap is larger than the quad they belong to. The data about the border vertices and triangles can be accessed from separate variables using the same index as when accessing the visible vertices and triangles. This worked for me, but the game ran extremely slow, especially when I had the profile here open. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but deprofiling the scene got me down to barely 3 FPS. This was not the performance that I seeked, so I decided to do the same thing as I did with the mesh generation code and put it all inside the calculate vertices and triangles function. Due to the limited times that we call this function, the normals will never be calculated unnecessarily. They are stored along with the other mesh data and simply accessed when needed again. Only if the player moves down to trigger a major change in LED does the calculate vertices and triangles function get called and update the normals. The actual elevation of the terrain was done using pretty much the same technique and code that Leg used. It would be a bit like plagiarizing if I just be told everything that he said in his video, so please check it out using the link in the description. To put it simply, I select a vertex on my planet, fetch the noise value at the vertex position within a 3D symbol of noise, and add that value when I extrude the point from the planet's center. All this comes together to create a pretty awesome planet, where you can fly around and explore. You can customize the terrain to your liking, to let's say, uh, make the mountain smoother or make noisier valleys. But, this wasn't how I planned to go about things in the beginning. For the first month or so since the last video, I researched and tried to implement a GPU based solution. My first idea was to use some sort of ray marching or fractal stuff to create mountains. I even rented a book on the topic, but it all went way over my head. When I realized that I didn't really have the time to learn about complex numbers and fractal geometry, I decided to generate a 2D height map and normal map that I would apply to the planet. I really far and managed to generate the normal map using nothing but the height map. Uh, but I couldn't for the life of me get it to work with the LOD once allowing the player to move around. So I'm challenging you to do what I couldn't and create your own GPU based planet terrain elevation. Just so that you have something to start with, I'd suggest that you google clip maps and read a few papers on it. There is also a really cool game called Altera Ant World, or something like that, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's spelled uh, like this. That's managed to create the most impressive LED plants that I've seen using real world map data. But that's pretty much everything for this video. As always, the GitHub repo is in the description if you want to look at my code. Again, this series isn't meant to be a tutorial series, uh, but more of an educational documentation of my development process. That's why you don't hear me telling you exactly what lines to write, where to write them, or even to write them at all. The important thing is that you understand my thought process. The rest is arbitrary. 
I will be taking a short break from this series to work on some other videos, um, but I will keep developing this in the background and update you once I do something worth posting about. Having this as the only thing that I work on has been quite stressful, so I think it's time for me to adapt. With that being said, if you've enjoyed the video, please rate it as you wish, and feel free to leave a comment if you have any questions or just want to chat. The subscribe button is also down there somewhere, uh, so why not hit it while you're already there. That's been it for this video, uh, thank you so much for watching, and uh, goodbye.